Hey, what's up, Street Talks? Eric Kim from the Eric and Street Photography blog. So I wanted to do this quick video. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be quick or not on terms uh, in terms of how to overcome photographer's block. The reason I wanted to talk about this is I know a lot of photographers that, you know, there's so many times in which we don't feel inspired. There's times we're like, oh, crap, you know, no matter how many cameras I have, I, do, you know, I always want to be inspired and, you know, create the best art I could. Um, and I wrote a, a free ebook titled, you know, How to Overcome Photographer's Blog. And the reason I wrote it was uh, I, I have dealt a lot with Photographer's Blog myself where um, not every single day I wake up and jump out of my bed. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready to shoot street photography. And, you know, even though I've been shooting for about like nine years now, there's still a lot of times where I have to kind of force myself to be creative. And there's so many different strategies and techniques that I've tried over the years. And hopefully... Um, uh, the purpose of this video is I hope to give you a few tips and tricks and uh, some certain lessons that I've learned along the way that hopefully you guys will find useful in terms of overcoming some of your photographer's block too. So talking about photographer's block, so if you're watching this video, you're probably, you know, have been through some instances where you haven't felt inspired and, you know, that might have led to buying a new camera and, you know, that's that's happened to me a lot too where, you know, I feel that oh, if I buy this new camera or this new lens or this new equipment, you know, suddenly I'll feel more inspired to go out and shoot and stuff like that. And it's, it's very rarely the case. And, um, you know, there are some certain caveats that I do believe that sometimes having different cameras can help spark some creativity. But, you know, I'll just kind of break down some, some ideas about how to overcome photographer's block. So one of the main reasons I think photographers face, quote, quote, photographer's block is perfectionism. So what is perfectionism? I think perfectionism is a state in which a photographer puts almost too much pressure on his or herself where every single photo you take has to be amazing and you always have to you know, be absolutely perfect in everything you do. In psychology, there is this difference between what they call being a quote-unquote maximizer and also being a satisficer. Uh, a maximizer is the type of person where, let's say you're going to buy a new camera, you have 30 tabs open on Google Chrome and you're reading every single review of every single camera, uh, or every single review of the camera you're trying to buy, you're reading, uh, you're watching YouTube videos and you want to make the absolute optimal best decision when you buy a camera. So that's a maximizer. A satisficer is somebody who, you know, uh, the word satisfies stands for suffice and satisfy. And you can learn more about this concept in a book called The Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz. And so, you know, you have maximizers and satisficers. Satisficers are like, you know, kind of good enough. So you read maybe a few reviews on a few cameras and you find something that's about 80% good and you just kind of stick with it and you don't worry too much about the small details. And, you know, think to yourself, uh, who is generally more happy or satisfied at the end of the day? The maximizer who has found every single option has fully optimized his or her options or the satisficer where you've looked at fewer options and you're just kind of more satisfied? Yep, it's uh, the satisficers. And it's, it's tricky because you think to yourself, oh, but what if I want you know to be maximally happy? I want to explore all the options. The irony psychologically is that sometimes being too much of a perfectionist and quote quote maximizing your options leads to unhappiness and also what psychologists call paralysis by analysis. What paralysis by analysis is when you analyze all your options too much that you become paralyzed, that you don't do anything at all. So to bring this back to photography, I think some photographers, especially street photographers who are too much of a perfectionist, you know, they'll have their camera on their neck and they'll see some scenes that they think are okay, but there's this inner critic in your head that says, you know, and this is what it says to me. It's like, oh, you know, Eric, don't take that photo. It's so boring. It's so cliche. It's already been done before. And if you listen too much to your uh, inner critic and you're out shooting all day, just kind of being a perfectionist, you just end up not taking any photographs. And at the end of the day, you know, you just you know, you, you face paralysis by analysis that you overanalyze the scenes uh, too much that you don't take any photos. You come home, you have no photos and therefore you're, you're stuck with photographer's block because you're saying to yourself, oh, you know, everything I see isn't so interesting and I have a boring life or my camera isn't good enough. And this is what you want to avoid as a photographer. 
my personal suggestion is uh, if you're a perfectionist, uh, so, so for example, for me, I am fortunate in the sense that I think genetically, and this is what they say, um, most people are genetically predisposed in terms of being a satisficer or a maximizer. I myself, I take after my mom and she's a satisficer. So, you know, if it's good enough, she just kind of goes with the flow. Uh, my dad tends to be more of a maximizer where he needs to find the absolute perfect option. There are pros and cons to each option, but I would say in terms of being an artist and being creative, I think being more of a satisficer will help you overcome photographer's block. Um, there are certain creatives and artists and photographers who are maximizers who create absolutely great work, but this talk isn't directed towards them because you know this is more about just how to overcome some sort of creative obstacles you might have. So when it comes to shooting street photography or any other sort of type of photography and you have photographer's block, give yourself permission to make shitty photos. <laughs> and you know a lot of photographers, they think that, oh, every single photo they take has to be an absolute masterpiece. No. Um, I think if you're shooting street photography, if you make at least one decent photo a month, and that's 20, 12 decent photos a year, you're doing really well. There's this common misconception, they call this uh, the myth of the decisive moment, in which, you know, for example, Henri Cartier-Bresson, you look at all of his amazing photos he's taken over the years, and you just kind of assume that every time he clicked the shutter, he just created amazing photos but if you look at books like magnum contact sheets you could kind of analyze his images and see that you know some of his best photos uh, for example there's this one famous photo he took a photo of a bunch of kids playing by uh, a broken brick wall uh, in spain you look at the photo and it's, it looks like an absolutely perfect image but he's actually taken 25 photos of the same scene to get that one amazing photo and even Henri Carter Bresson said sometimes you have to milk the cow a lot to get a little bit of cheese, meaning sometimes you had to click the shutter a lot just to get a few good photographs. And so um, when you see a good scene, and this is just another practical tip I get, if you see a scene and you have even a tiny bit of a chance that something in the back of your head says, oh, okay, this might be a good photo, I'm not sure, just shoot it anyways, because it's better to have shot it and then go home and say, okay, it's not a good photo, then not having taken it all because sometimes your inner critic is wrong and it's he's a bastard or she's a bastard and you shouldn't listen to them because when you're out shooting on the streets i think it's better to shoot more from the gut and follow that intuition of um, the intuitive side of yourself and then when you go home you could be more of a you know and an editor and you're kind of choosing the best images and stuff like that and and this is the problem is that uh, the shooting phase and the editing phase i think should be two separate phases because when you're out shooting on the streets only focus on shooting don't think what you're going to keep and what you're going to ditch while you're shooting leave that when you go home and this is another reason i don't recommend chimping when it comes to photography because when you're taking a photo and then you immediately look at the lcd screen afterwards you kind of are confusing your brain in terms of the shooting and editing phase because if you're looking at the lcd screen you're you're essentially editing aka choosing your best images or deciding what to keep and what not to to keep and uh, another practical tip when you're out shooting just turn off your lcd screen don't chimp and then uh when you go home you could decide what to keep or not and i don't I, i'd recommend to never delete photos in the back of your camera on your lcd screen because a the LCD screen is too small to see whether you got something good or not. And B, once again, you're kind of confusing yourself between the editing and shooting phase. Um, one of the best tips I learned about writing was when you're writing, just do stream of consciousness. Don't worry about punctuation, capitalization, if you sound stupid or not. Just write it all down and just, ha just write straight for like an hour or two, whatever. And then when you're done writing, then you can go back and edit all your text. So the same philosophy I think applies to photography where when you're out, just shoot all your photos. Then when you go home, decide what to keep or uh, what to not keep. And I'm just going to continue by sharing some practical things uh, in terms of overcoming your perfectionism and overcoming photography block. So one of the, the big tips I would say is a lot of a lot of photographers complain that oh I don't have enough free time that you know and you know it might be true that you're you're probably busy with family with work all these other obligations but I think the mistake photographers make is they try to separate their lives their personal lives and their photography so tip number one is 
try to think live photography integration. And what I mean by that is your life and your photography shouldn't be separate. I think they should be the same. Meaning, don't try to figure out how you could fit photography into um, your schedule by saying, oh, I need to find an extra hour or two to just go and shoot. I would say, try to find the little breaks in between your daily schedule while you're living your daily life to make photos. Um, so what I mean by that is, sometimes for me, the best photos I take, even though I'm a quote-unquote full-time street photographer, you know, I have a life like you guys, you know, I'm on my phone and my computer a lot. I have to go to Costco, buy groceries, run errands, stuff like that. And so um, times where I do a lot of my shooting is, you know, uh, I'm driving Cindy to class, then I drop her off, you know, might have 30 minutes to stop by a cafe, have a cup of coffee, just walk around back the block, take like 10 photos or whatever, or the days where, uh, you know, I'm just having lunch with Cindy. And know that every single photo you shoot doesn't have to be cool, cool street photography. Just be a photographer, live, live, your, live your life. And so I'll shoot photos of Cindy, I'll shoot photos of my food, shoot photos of my friends, the family, whatever. Other times where I'm uh, commuting and I live in California, the Bay Area, there's not too much traffic, but let's say when I was living in LA or days where I'm stuck in traffic, I'll just have my camera in my glove compartment, or not my glove compartment, my, um, uh, the, you know, where there's a little drink holder. I'll just stick my camera there. So uh, what I've been doing recently is I just have my Leica, my, uh, where's, where's, my where's my little bad boy, right? So I'll just have my Leica. And I'll literally just kind of insert it into my drink holder. And so I'm driving and I'm stuck in traffic and I look out the window and, you know, do this at your own peril because this could be dangerous. <laughs> but I'll see something interesting and I'll just take a photo while I'm stopped in traffic, take a few photos and use uh, the interior of the, the car uh, window pane to, to make photos. So sometimes that's when I'll, I'll take photos. Um, today, for example, I went to the DMV with Cindy for it to get her new uh, driver's license. And I just, you know, I'm just, I'm just walking into the DMV, just have my camera on my neck, and you just see all these other people who are bored waiting. And I just took about like 10 photos of people waiting at in front of the DMV, and then they just looked at me funny. I just kind of smiled and uh, moved on. And so, you know, photography life integration, uh, going to, if let's say you go to the grocery store, just bring your camera along, have it strapped around your, your shoulder or your neck, um, and just make photos in those small breaks in between your day. Because I think having, not not having, uh, I think the excuse not having enough time to shoot, I think that's a kind of a, a misguided one in the sense that, you know, you could shoot just in one or five minute breaks. Also know that uh, another practical tip in terms of overcoming photographer's block, it doesn't have to be a big fancy camera. So let's say you have a DSLR, you have a 5D Mark II or whatever, or some other Nikon camera. If you find yourself having a really difficult time going out and shooting all the time, just use your smartphone. So if you have an iPhone, Android device, whatever, maybe you could give yourself an assignment that, okay, for the next month, I'm just going to lock my DSLR or Micro Four Thirds camera or whatever, whatever camera you have, just lock in a cupboard and say, I'm only allowed to shoot on my smartphone. And a lot of people look down on smartphones like, oh, you know, it's just a smartphone. It's not a real camera, whatever. I think that's a bunch of BS. The smartphone cameras you get, uh, you have nowadays, like uh, especially like I see it on like iPhone sixes and six pluses, whatever. They're as good, if not better, than point and shoot cameras we had even, you know, three three years ago. And it's it's always on you and it's always with you. So just give your assignment that you could shoot everything on your smartphone. And ironically enough, I think some of the best contemporary street photographers are people who shoot mostly or solely on their smartphones because they always have it with them. There's no excuse, and they just end up shooting a lot. Uh, another practical tip I give is don't use a camera bag. I've used all the different camera bags over the years, and trust me, there is no perfect or ideal camera bag. Generally, I have found, though, that the smaller your camera bag is, the less crap you put in it, and therefore, the, most like, the more likely you are to carry around with you and make a lot of different photographs. So... Um, the, the big issue of having camera bags is generally, if you have a camera and you put it inside your camera bag, it generally stays in your camera bag. And, you know, I, I generally recommend everyone always, you know, always carry your camera with you. And for me, for a long time, that meant just always having my camera bag with me. But the problem I discovered was 
when my camera was in my bag, sure, I always had my camera with me, but it was like, I'm lazy. So even taking the camera out of my bag was just too much work. And not only that, but when the camera was inside my bag, I just saw fewer photographs. And so what I discovered was uh, a better option was just always having my camera not in my camera bag, but literally on me. Uh, one, one way I uh, carry my camera nowadays, I just have an extra. And I just carry around my neck and just walk around like a, an Asian tourist. Or if you want to look cool, you could always just take your camera and just strap it over your shoulder and just walk around. And so, you know, I'm gonna, Cindy says, oh, pick me up at school. All right, cool. So I'll just leave the apartment, toss the camera on my shoulder, whatever, and then I'll just toss it into my passenger seat. And it's literally just kind of like my buddy that, that, that takes care of me. Or when I'm going to Costco, buy some groceries, I'll just keep it around my neck, you know, buy some groceries that way. Or sometimes you could even strap it over your, your neck and then just kind of sideways this way. Sometimes this way is a little bit more ergonomic, whatever. And so um, this is another practical tip is if you want to make more photos, you want to make some more time to, to make photos, literally have your camera on you. And that's another practical tip I'll give you. Another thing with photographer's block is we just become so jaded and life is so boring and everything looks the same. And this is the irony is that a lot of photographers think to themselves, oh, you know, I wish I lived in New York or Tokyo or these other interesting places. I'd be a better photographer or I'd see more interesting things. A funny thing about being a human being, uh, and this is a psychological bias we have, is we become bored by our lives, no matter how interesting or wonderful our lives are. So for example, I have friends in New York City, and I'm like, wow, you must be so excited and constantly inspired because New York City, you know, I'd love to live here. And they're like, nah, you know, New York City is whatever. You just kind of get bored of it. I, you know, I wish I was in Paris because Paris is so much more romantic and it's better for street photography, whatever. So I go to Paris, talking to my friends there, they're like, no, you know, Paris is so boring, it's so cliche, blah, blah, blah. I'd rather be in Tokyo, because Tokyo, there's so much action. I go to Tokyo, talk to my friends there, and they're like, oh, you know, Tokyo's whatever, it's just all these salary men, and, you know, it's so busy here. I wish I was in New York. So moral of the story is, no matter where you are, the grass is always greener on the other side. Then you might argue, okay, Look, I live here in the suburbs, uh, you know, I commute an hour to and fro from work every single day. At least people in New York City have more opportunities. And I'm actually <laughs> uh, currently in Garden Grove with Cindy's family, and it's a boring suburb. But, you know, always, no matter how boring of a place you live in, there's always opportunities. Like, so for example, um, you know, if you're an American living in the States and living in a suburb, it's really, quote, quote, boring. But... If you brought a European from out of the country to an American suburb, they're like, wow, this place is like kind of really weird. You know, everyone has huge houses, huge SUVs. And so one another strategy of overcoming your photographer's block is be a tourist in your own city. Imagine you came here for the first time. What would you find weird? Because even the concept of an American suburb is a very strange concept. It's only been around for like half a century or so. And... Or just, you know, uh, another tip I have is, you know, even just going to the mall, you know, you have all these really rich, uh, rich people just shopping. To me, this is sociologically interesting. So, you know, I'll take photos there or even just taking photos at like, um, the gas station, looking at other photos to take at uh, inside Starbucks. There's always so many opportunities, no matter how boring of a place you live in. Uh, another practical tip I'll have in terms of, you know, overcoming photographer's block. Okay, so let's say you are really bored of your place, or let's say you just shot it to death, like you know, you live somewhere and you photographed it for like 10 years, like, okay, I just need to get out of here. I do believe that injecting a little bit of randomness into your life, um, into your daily schedule is a good way to overcome this. So I don't know about you, but whenever I go to the cafe or if I'm driving around town, I always take the same route because I've memorized it. Try to take a different route and go around your city because no matter how well you know your city there are certain parts of town that you don't know so maybe you know just totally drive to somewhere that you've never been in town or just drive a, a different route or even just do a small little road trip and get like uh 30 minutes or an hour out of your own city and just visit the neighboring city or also of course traveling is always a, a great option i uh, one thing i learned about the psychology of happiness is that you know 
if you want to really be happy and you have spare money, don't spend it on material things. Spend it on experiences because experiences bring us happiness and they always stay with us. Whereas stuff, we just kind of get used to it. So maybe if you have uh, a few hundred bucks lying around, just you know, do a round trip ticket to a nearby city that you might find interesting. And I actually find the thing about traveling that I like the most isn't so much that I make good photos while I'm traveling because uh, if I could make even one interesting photo a week while I'm traveling, I'm doing pretty well. It's actually that uh, after I travel for a while and I come back home, I learned actually to appreciate home more. And I'm like, wow, you know, my home I always think is so boring. But, you know, A, you know, you go back and you're on your own, your own, your own bed. And you're like, oh, I love my bed. I love my town. I love my neighborhood. I love my apartment, whatever. And so sometimes it does take a little bit of getting out of town or getting out of your comfort zone or traveling to appreciate home more. Another practical tip I have for overcoming, you know, quote, quote, photographer's block is switching up your gear. So, you know me, I'm always like, oh, buy books, not gear, you know, don't worry about gas, gear acquisition syndrome, buying a new camera is not going to make you more creative. And it mostly is true, but I actually do have found that there are certain circumstances where switching up your gear has helped to overcoming certain uh, creative barriers I've personally had. So one of the big things that's helped me was actually shooting, uh, starting from digital and then uh, switching to film. And even nowadays I shoot you know both. I I have my um, film like a MP camera, right? And also like to shoot a lot with my digital Ricoh GR. It's a little point and shoot, and so I shoot with both. I mean, ultimately, it's like uh, it's like reading books. Like I I have a I have a Kindle, right? So I like to read a lot of ebooks on the Kindle, but at the end of the day, I actually prefer reading paperback books, like real books, and it just you know, so I, I've been thinking a lot about like you know, film versus digital, whatever. It's it's not either or, it's both. And so when I switch from shooting a lot, mostly digital to film, I shoot about probably 90% of my photos nowadays on film. I've, I just found it to be uh, really fun and exciting because I was always so used to shooting uh, digital and the process was pretty straightforward and I enjoyed post-processing, whatever. But once I started shooting film, I was terrified because I didn't know if the photos would actually come out or would be black, whatever. Another thing that I had a lot of fun was I actually starting to teach myself more about manual exposure. A film like, a, you know, everything's fully manual, aperture, shutter speed. And so I started to to really be able to relight better. So I'll, I'll go outside on a sunny day. And I'm like, oh, at ISO 400 film, this is a thousandth of a second at F8. And shooting film has also helped me... Um, see the world differently because when I'm shooting with digital and I'm shooting raw, I'll take a photo and I'm thinking at the back of my head, I wonder how I'm going to post process this photo to make it look the way I want it to look like. Whereas when I'm shooting with film, so currently I'm actually shooting like, a, um, you know, let's say I'm shooting, uh, I have a roll of portrait in here, but I'm actually shooting a lot of tri -X. I'm switching to mostly black and white film. I'll shoot a scene and take a photo and think to myself, I wonder how the photo is going to turn out. Because when you're shooting film, you know, after you scan the film, you, you know, you could still play with the exposure a little bit, whatever, but the look you get, it's kind of a little bit more out of your control. So I take photos because I'm curious of what the photos are going to end up looking like. Whereas with digital, it's more like I take the photo and I have supreme control in terms of how I want the photo to, to look. So shooting film has actually given me less control over the outcome, which has actually been more exciting and more fun for me. And um, other things about shooting film, uh, after taking a photo, uh, I usually wait about three, six months, sometimes even a year before getting developed, because partly it's because I'm lazy, but also part of it is I like to like marinate my film. I like to sit on them for a long time, not worry how they're gonna turn out. And so when I finally get my photos back, I'm really excited to get the back in. I've, have, I've, I've forgotten having taken them, so I'm more objective in terms of editing, in terms of choosing what I like. Whereas with digital, I'm a little bit too, you know, I shoot it, download it into Lightroom real quick, then post-process it, upload to Facebook, you, um, Flickr, Instagram, whatever. And so films actually helped me slow down and appreciate uh, the photographic process at the end of the day. And also, to a large extent, I prefer the aesthetic of shooting film over digital. And honestly, at the end of the day, it's not better or worse, they're just different used for different things like, for example, um, I'm using mostly my Ricoh for shooting up close street portraits. So I'll put this into macro mode 
and I could literally focus this like, uh, let's see, like that close, right? And then I'll even use a pop-up flash and let's see. Uh, now shoot. Oh, how that happened? So I'll shoot just like super up close portraits of myself. This is pretty Inception, right? Photo of me inside of a photo of me. And so, yeah, and then, so this is a good way to, to kind of switch things up creatively. So let's say you shot digital your entire life and you never tried film. I would just say just try to experiment. If, it, if, if you've ever had a, even a tiny bit of interest in trying it out, give it a shot. Uh, similarly, let's say you're a dinosaur or like a, a douche egg hipster like me shooting film. Uh, try shooting digital, see how you like it. Um, or other options, you've never shot an iPhone or your smartphone, just only shoot with your smartphone. Uh, I recommend using VSEO to process your photos afterwards. Uh, other things that I've personally tried in the past, uh, shooting mostly a 35 millimeter you know, film to try medium format. I have a Hasselblad at home, shot medium format, and discovered ultimately I enjoyed the really, I really enjoyed the experience, but it ultimately wasn't for me because it was too big, it was too bulky, and for me, image quality isn't that important. Um, but I did enjoy the experience. I know other people, uh, Blake uh, Blake Andrews, he shoots a lot with uh, Fujifilm Instaxes. So, you know, I actually have this Instax. I've actually had this for about like five years, and you know. Even using this to to make photographs could be quite fun, or you know, experimenting with large format. If you shoot mostly black and white, maybe try color. Shoot color, try black and white, try different films. Just experiment, and you know, I think this is the tough thing. Is I think it's it's good to experiment, but I do believe there is something as too much experimentation where you're just doing a little bit of everything and you're just not really focused. But I do believe that it is important to experiment a lot to find out what you like and more importantly, what you don't like. So for example, what I discovered, I don't really like to shoot with big cameras. I prefer small uh, compact cameras. I don't like any other focal length really, it, besides a 35, maybe a 28. So even on my Leica, the 35, this 35 F2 lens is the only camera I really own. Transitioning, this is, you know, sorry to, to, to confuse you guys, but also a good way to overcome photographer's block is sometimes just not having any other options for cameras and just literally having one camera, one lens. So in the past, I've, I've had a lot of different cameras. And the irony is the more cameras you have, the less creative you are in the sense that you get paralysis by analysis. Once again, you have so many cameras, like which camera should I shoot with today? And the days where I actually do make the mistake of going out with my digital camera and my film camera, there's a half a second of a hesitation that, that oh, should I shoot this film or should digitally. And so for me, ultimately, I've discovered for me, having one camera, one lens is the ideal thing to have because you don't have to think about what to do. Uh, for example, apparently Obama only has two suits. He has a, a, a dark navy suit and um, a black suit or a gray suit, I don't remember. But he wakes up, he doesn't have a lot of options for what to wear, so he could spend more of his energy on more important things like being the president. Uh, similarly, Steve Jobs had his entire outfit, just like this black turtleneck made. He wore literally the same single outfit every single day, so he had more decision-making energy for running Apple. Similarly in your photography, if you find yourself having too many cameras, too many options, use one camera, one lens, either sell all your other cameras, or just toss them all in a box, and just literally shoot with only one camera, one lens. Always have it with you, and this way, you don't have process by analysis. You know always which camera to, to shoot with. Another practical suggestion is if you feel uninspired with your photography, you know, even though I did say, yeah, try out shooting film or trying out different cameras, whatever, um, a more practical and affordable option is buy bucks, not gear. So every t and, okay, so I suffer from gas and I love toys. I love gadgets, like I love smartphones new laptops, tablets, whatever. And I've always been a sucker for technology ever since I was a kid. And so there are times where I undergo moments of doubt or hesitation where I'm like, man, I don't know what, where my photography is going. Or then you go on the internet, you see some photographer shooting with some sort of type of camera or lens. You're like, wow, you know, this guy's work is great. Maybe if I bought that camera, I'd feel more inspired and stuff like that. But, you know, it fades really quickly. Whereas 
every so nowadays whenever I have an itch for this inkling to buy a new camera and spend a lot of money on crap I don't need, I'll just buy a photography book. You know, you can get a good photography book for about you know anywhere from like you go to the bookstore, get something cheap for ten bucks, twenty bucks. You know, working your way up, thirty, forty, fifty. The more expensive books are about eighty bucks, and then you know they're they're not always cheap. You could always go to the library and you could rent them or borrow them. But I've I've regretted so much buying all these different cameras and lenses in the past that I didn't really need. I've never really regretted buying a photography book because photography books don't get outdated, right? <laughs> you know, like you buy like a Kindle and it's like outdated in six months, or even a smartphone. But a photography book will be there with you forever, and looking the inspiration and the experience I get from looking at a photography book is so liberating and exciting and it really motivates me to make more good photography and so the days where I'm not feeling inspired I just go on Amazon uh, usually I'll look at recommended uh, options based on the books I bought and usually I'll find a couple of good books to buy or I'll just go to the photography bookstore just even leafing through a book um, a suggestion I have with photography books because there's so many to buy Maybe just try it out first, you know, look look at them through a bookstore. I would recommend only buying photography books that you imagine look at more than once because I bought like hundreds of photography books over the years. Honestly, there's probably only 10 books that I've actually read more than once. So, you know, I don't know if, what I should do with my library. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, always look at photography books. It's good, uh, good, uh, good inspiration. Another practical tip is connect with other photographers. So no man is his own island and you know, whenever I'm feeling uninspired or unmotivated by my photography, generally I'm lucky that, you know, I travel, I teach photography workshops, and being around other students and other photographers really helps re-inspire me. Or, you know, I'll send text messages to my other photography friends and, you know, ask them for their opinions and they send me their photos. And really being part of a community is one of the best ways to step outside our photographer's blog because being around other motivated, inspirational people could also inspire you. And know that this community doesn't always have to be in real life. I mean, ideally, real life is better, but, you know, you can find them on Instagram, you can find them on Fl uh, Flickr, join, you know, different uh, Facebook groups, and connecting with these people could be a good way to inspire yourself. But I've always found the best way to get inspired is sitting with other photographers, you know, maybe message another photographer locally, send them a message on Flickr, say, hey, you know, my name is blah, 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 and I like your work. Would you mind having a coffee or a beer sometime? Another practical tip to overcome photographer's block, Pick up a different art. Maybe you're sick of shooting photos. See if you could pick up uh, a musical instrument or pick up painting, drawing, sculpture, whatever it may be. Uh, dance. There's so many different other types of arts out there. Uh, go to museums, see other exhibitions. And, you know, who knows? Maybe at the end of the day, photography really isn't the best way for you to express yourself creatively. And that's, that's okay. But, you know, <laughs> I've, I've tried picking up drawing and, you know, rage quitted after like literally an hour and I'm like no photography is kind of what uh, I prefer um, other practical pieces of advice so for those of you guys who follow my blog you know I'm kind of a, a caffeine addict uh, it's, it's pretty bad but uh, I've actually been detoxing from caffeine for about kind of like a month or so like I've I used to drink like six espressos a day which is I don't recommend and I cut it down to like a green tea once a day and to me that's not enough caffeine but today you know I had a double shot of espresso and I feel amazing that's why I actually I'm making this video right now because I have all these creative ideas swirling around and and you know one of the the ways I think to be uh, creative and motivated and inspired especially when the weather's not good or your mood's not good just have a cup of coffee have a nice tea if you're into that um, I know so for some people uh, alcohol helps them relax sorry the dogs are barking in the background uh and not to say that you should be pounding shots of vodka but you know i know some people that they'll have a beer in the evening uh watch a movie look at a photo book and it really does help them creatively as well and uh yeah the last tip i would have is you know just publish your work because you know sometimes perfectionism you're like oh this photo isn't good enough it's okay to publish bad work. I mean, I used to be more of a stickler on this, but at the end of the day, if your goal isn't to become the world's best photographer, and that's not really my goal either, but just try to be the best photographer you can. Don't compare yourself to other people. And it's okay to publish bad photos on the internet. Um, and what my suggestion would be is, if you're going to upload a photo that you're not sure about, in the comments, just say something like, hey guys, I know this isn't the best photo, but if you guys could give me honest feedback and critique on this photo, you know, tear me apart, whatever, that'd be awesome. So 
so yeah, these are some practical ideas in terms of overcoming photographer's block. And I'll leave you guys with certain assignments that you guys could try out to overcome any other sort of obstacles you might have. So assignment number one, shoot a roll of film every day for 30 days. So uh, a lot of photographer, uh, photography teachers recommend this. And you know, I, I've actually followed a similar project myself where it just, it has to be, it doesn't have to be uh, an expensive film camera. But I do recommend a film camera because shooting a roll, one roll of film, 36 frames, and having uh, the rolls of film accumulate, to me, it actually, it's more inspirational. Um, I mean, I'm sure you could try this digitally, but I don't think it would really work. So um, I'd recommend film. So shoot a roll of film every single day for 30 days straight, and you have to shoot the full roll, the 36 photos. And know that every single photo you take hasn't, has, doesn't have to be an amazing photo. Uh, I know other photo, uh, photographers digitally, they do 365 day projects, which I think is fine, but I think honestly, uploading photos every single day could be kind of a drag, but I think shooting every single day is, is a better strategy. And so shoot a, a roll of film every single day for 30 days straight and give yourself permission to make really shitty photos. At the end of 30 days, you'll have, you know, 36 times 30 days, you have a lot of photos. And then you'll end up making a few photos that you're actually quite happy about and you'll discover that uh, all this photographer's block is just only in your head. Assignment number two, don't upload your photos for about six months. So this kind of goes with a, a point number one. Sometimes a lot of perfectionism comes to having to share good work, but if you've kind of given yourself permission to make bad photos and not uploading your photos and kind of disconnecting from social media is a good way for you to be more uh, inward centered and shooting for yourself rather than trying to please other people. Assignment number three, maybe just start a photography blog. Uh, for me, having a photography blog and having an audience to me gives me more incentive to go out and shoot or write or do everything else because when you feel like you don't have an audience, uh, depends on your personality, but for me, I don't feel as inspired or motivated. Uh, and the last assignment is <laughs> um, go out and shoot an entire day without film in your camera or an SD card. And then see how frustrated you'll feel, which will inspire you again. So, um, you know, uh, this this assignment comes from this experience where I, when I first started shooting film and didn't know how to load my film correctly, I went out and shot film the entire day and you know, 36, 37, 38, 39, I'm like, crap, I probably didn't roll my film. Pop up my back, realized that the film wasn't catching. So I shot an entire day without any film. And of course I was frustrated because you know, I thought I had taken all these amazing photos, but at the same time, it made me realize that I wanted, it helped me enjoy the process more. But at the same time, it actually inspired me to go out and shoot. Or if you do this with a digital camera, don't put in a memory card and just pretend to shoot the entire day. You'll feel so frustrated that like, oh crap, I wish I had a memory card here, that you'll rush home, pop in your SD card, and you'll start shooting again and be inspired. And yeah, so these are some practical tips I have for overcoming photographer's block. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about uh, other strategies in terms of overcoming photographer's block just google you know air kim how to overcome photographer's block or just go to airkimphotography.com slash blog in the top menu bar there's a start here section all my free ebooks and my my free ebook on overcoming photographer's block should be there as well so the last thing i want to leave with you guys is you know you guys are probably watching this on youtube my blog whatever uh, leave a comment below and share some uh practical tips in terms of uh, strategies that have helped you overcome photographer's block. We'd love to hear uh, certain strategies you use and would also help the photographer, uh, the rest of the photography community. All right, so hopefully, plan to do more of these videos, but thanks for watching, guys, and peace out.